All right, this week we'll cover uh, some aspects of what overhaul means, um, cleaning, and lower end stuff. You stretch a lot, it always throws me off. I never know if you have a question, I have to wait. It's fine, I'll get used to it. Um, last week, the test results were not so great when it came to dealing with plank or the other one, valve overlap and such. So I will put that on this week's test as well. I know. <laughs> I think that'll be my new thing. Whenever you do really bad on something, I'll either. So if you have questions on how to do that, I will be here. I get here early every day, come in, say, hey, go over it. If you're embarrassed, get a couple other people to come with you. Bring them in. Say, hey, these dummies don't know the answer. Could you explain it to them? I'll make sure that you do it right. So. All right. So that video doesn't work. I don't know why I put this here. I guess we can find out. No, we are not going to do 17 minutes. <laughs> that sounds like something that we will do on a break. All right talked about that already so we'll get we'll get back to that so I guess we're gonna do a bunch of note ready for that first that's what we're gonna do all right let's we'll edit that part out all right week two how's it going so far uh, grudging through the <coughs> familiarity with the manual mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what it means before we just run to you good if you have questions make sure you ask all right, let's talk about overhaul, the word overhaul. Right? This kind of goes back to uh, 309, I believe. Steps of an overhaul. <clears throat> That's really kind of what you're doing, right? It's sort of a quasi overhaul in the engine. And when you're dealing with, with uh, piston engine aircraft, I mean, the word overhaul comes up a lot. How long has it been since overhaul in the engine? Um, overhaul in the prop. Cylinders, magnetos, all kinds of stuff. So we got to talk about uh, what is an overhaul? What does it entail? Well, it's not my opinion. It comes out of FAR 43.2, Alpha 1 and 2 is where I'm getting all this from. So it says the steps of an overhaul. There are very distinct steps that the FAA says you must do in order to call it an overhaul. And it is. Help me out here. Should be review. Disassemble. Disassemble. Next. Clean. Clean. Inspect. Next. Mm, eh, it falls under this. I think that measuring is more of an inspect. Uh, Repair. Then, assemble. Okay, it's all back together. Test. 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 Test in accordance with. By the way, in aviation, we often abbreviate right? that as I A W in accordance with. <clears throat> approved standards <coughs> and technical data. <coughs> you can't just test it to whatever you want, uh, even if it's better. Uh, and I forget sometimes if it's Continental or Lycoming or says what or the other. Uh, most of them are pretty similar. But like now we're getting into doing some cylinder work outside there and I'm showing you how to lap in your valves and how to test the valves. Well, if you were to look it up in the overhaul manual, you're not going to see the procedure that I'm using. It's really not an approved procedure. Uh, it's a fine, you can do extraneous stuff. 
You're extraneous meaning more than, as long as it isn't destructive. So if it says to put the valves in the cylinder and put the springs on and pour kerosene into the ports and see if the kerosene leaks out of the cylinder, well, you can do air first. And if it doesn't leak air, chances are it's not gonna leak kerosene. But you can't do air and say, well, if it holds air, it won't leak kerosene and skip that. So you have to do it with exactly the way they want it to. Probably one of the biggest violations, well, there's a lot of violations out there. Um, I was thinking about clean. When you look at uh, the list for what you're supposed to do on an annual inspection, it says you're supposed to wash your aircraft. Very few people do. Um, when you test an engine, I know so many shops will, uh, they'll do an overhaul on the engine and then they get done with the reassemble and they'll just send it back to the customer and say, well, you know, make sure you test it before you fly it, you know, and then they, you know, that shop installs the engine, they get out, they start it up, they run it up, you know, do a really good run up. Hey, we tested it, go fly. But if you read what the test procedures are in the manual, it's quite extensive and it takes hours and hours of testing and you have to all the right equipment. You have to have um, test clubs, you have to have scoops, you have to have calibrated instruments, on and on and on. So, you gotta make sure you do that. Uh, let's see, definitions. How come there's not an abbreviation for abbreviations? That's a very long word. All right, overhaul versus rebuilt. <clears throat> that comes out of 43.2 Bravo. This is stuff I think I asked you in 309. What is the difference between overhaul versus rebuilt? Overhaul is to uh, serviceable standards and rebuilt is to new standards. You got it. So quoting it, it'd be rebuilt is the same as above. That's quoting it as above. <clears throat> no, that's not quoting it. I think I meant to say same as above is in disassemble, clean, inspect, repair is necessary, reassemble and test, but now I'm quoting it, tested to the same tolerance and limits as a new item. I go on, using either new parts or used parts that are either conform to the new part tolerance and limits or to approved oversize or undersized dimensions. So as, and I, sh I didn't bring in uh, actual dimensions, which might have been helpful for this one, but as you will find out with your engine possibly, is that uh, in light combing in the crankshaft world, when the crankshaft is made, they're gonna give you some dimensions. Anybody have the light combing manual handy at all? Yeah. Yeah, here we go. Take the limits in there. Perfect, guy comes prepared. Unlike his instructor. <laughs> Let me see. We want Let me see. Too late. Let's edit this part out. Valves, 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 finish guides, valves. Should have already seen it. Are you missing a page?
Yeah. I got some stuff there. Okay, there's no problem. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm looking at the table of limits. Table of limits, which I think everybody's looked at so far, right? Yes. Okay, so we've got uh, the reference number. I talked about that. We got chart. And it has, this column has an A, and this one's got B, D, G, J, S, T, on and on and on. What is, what is that column there for? Different models of engines. Which model do you have? The Bravo, which is 0290. And the Bravo 1 is the D2, but you have the Bravo. So I want to look down here, and I see diameter of main bearing journal on crankshaft. Main bearing journals. So main bearing journal. Main. Right? Everybody knows what the main bearing journal is? <clears throat> yes. All right. And it says manufacture minimum. Manufacture minimum um, and max. Max. And then it gives me a number. Let me find my Bravo here. Bravo. Main bearing. Main diameter. Main uh, 2.3745, 2.3745, and then it's got 2.375, 2.375, and then that is manufacturer minimum max, and it says service max. Service max is? E. E. So I don't know, has anybody found the E on your micrometer yet? <laughs> It's there, you got an E on there. All right, so if I go back page, I'm like, well, what does this E mean? Because, you know, everything has some sort of meaning. And this is where a lot of uh, aircraft mechanics get in a huge amount of trouble. They're like, well, I don't know. E probably stands for excellent. E says permissible where the crankshaft raw domain journals is to be minus 0 0.0015 on the diameter, which is to say it's minus 0 0.0015 on the diameter. So that means that what is the biggest this crankshaft was when it came out of the factory? 2.375. 2.375. And then it wears down to how much? And still to 2. I'll just say 2.3745. So as long as it's this number or bigger, which is half a thou, right? As long as it's, it doesn't matter if it's got 10,000 hours on the crankshaft. As long as it's somewhere between these two numbers, it is considered new. new. And then it goes from here down to how much? 4.372. 37, got to subtract 0015, which would be 2? 3. 3. 1 half, 3. 2. So, gets down to that. And... What if it measures 2.373? Serviceable. What if the entire crankshaft, as far as you can measure, it was 2.375, except for one little spot was 2.3744? Then the whole thing is serviceable. If anything is outside of the new, the whole thing is serviceable. If anything is outside of the service limit, then the whole thing is out of limits is a better term. All right, I, I, except I want to be careful how I say that. The mains are one thing, the rods are something different. So you could say the mains are all new and the rods are all out of limits, and we can deal with that. Um, so after new, that's standard. Because if you remember up here, it says rebuilt, same tolerance, tested to the same tolerance and limits as a new item. Um, using used parts that either conform to new part tolerance and limits or to approved oversized or undersized dimensions. Well, Lycoming is real nice to you because they have MO3, which is to say it's minus 0 0.003 on the diameter. So we just minus 3 thousandths from that. So new becomes 2.372 to 2.3715. Follow? Um, and then serviceable will be 2.370. Now, they don't write that in the book anywhere. These dimensions, you have to do the math yourself. Everybody follow so far? You may have that. Then after that is MO6, and so you'd subtract another three from that, which I'm not going to do, and then M10. All right, and so you can have M10 all new. Now, of course, when you go to MO3, 6, or 10, you got to get different bearings, so it's a different part number. 
And so you'll see the part number with MO3 after it, meaning the bearings are a little thicker. thicker. Got to be thicker to take up that space. So that's your oversized, undersized, new. So I could have a crankshaft that's M10, new. New limits, M10. Uh, okay, but going back to this, so what's the whole point? Overhaul versus rebuild, right? So if your entire engine is within new limits, then you could technically call it a rebuild. rebuild. You as a mechanic, you, you can actually do that. I would never do it, never have done it uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, almost all aircraft owners have no idea what that means. So why throw yourself out there and get yourself into trouble for something they don't care? In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if an owner came back after overhauling an engine and saying I rebuilt it. Hey, hey, hey. I paid for an overhaul. I don't know what's this rebuild business. It's called an overhaul. It's what they paid for. It's what they think they want. Give it to them. Don't, you know, don't make, don't make problems where it doesn't need to be. Otherwise, you have to sit them down and explain it. Well, okay, the difference is, so really, I... <coughs> um, so we just use the word overhaul almost all the time. Um, why else would I not do it? If you missed one measurement and the entire engine was serviceable, then the entire engine is an overhaul. It would have to be the entire thing. Boy, if you messed up on one little dimension, got close, I don't know, it's just not worth arguing about with somebody. All right, so overhaul. So we're talking about overhauls then, but we know what a rebuild is. Um, overhaul. By the way, we call it a major overhaul often. Got a major overhaul the engine. I don't. I just say you overhaul the engine. I don't know. It is overhaul. Look at this. A major alteration. This is going to be a question. Major alteration or repair. Is it a major alteration or is it a major repair? Now, you haven't had a whole lot of experience with this outside of a little bit of 309 stuff, I believe. But, what's that? A repair. Um, I could ask this a bit. Is it a major alteration repair or a minor alteration to repair? Most minor. It is a minor repair. So, major alteration is a minor repair. But let me back up a little bit and explain that. So, in 43 FAR, FAR 43 Appendix A... The FAA gives us a list of things that are, there's major alterations and there's major repairs. And so there's kind of a, a preamble that uh, a major repair is sort of defined as anything that when not done by elementary procedures, such as just simply bolting, which is to say if you had to rivet it on um, or it's more of a complex operation, it'd be called a major repair. If you're changing something from the original types or type design, it's a major alteration, no matter how minor it is. Like I've said before, changing the air filter on my aircraft is a major alteration because I use a bracket air filter, a little foam air filter, and not the paper one it came with. It's a major alteration to the aircraft, which you think, really, that's it. But, you know, by definition, that's what it is. Um, so an overhauling most engines, piston engines, is simply a... Minor repair. We don't really say minor. It's just a repair. It's not a major repair. It's not a major alteration. So it's just, um, so I'll put this. So most engines, or most engine over, piston engine overall, of course, because that's all we're talking about in here. Most piston engine overhauls are, uh oh. <laughs> so on an exhaust valve, if the valve is green, they're telling me it's bad. And if it's red, it's good. Green means stop. I hadn't heard of this, so I told my we'll check with you. Yeah, green green is bad. So if the valve is green, it's bad? Yeah, burnt pizza is good. Red is good? Burnt pizza, red is good. Green means stop. Alright. <laughs> you know what? You if you want to, what you can do is uh, just go home and send them all down here because they obviously didn't learn a damn thing. <laughs> 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 
most disinterested. Yeah, by the way, don't bullshit the next teacher because Larry, he'll call me on a Saturday. Uh, you're, when you're in, uh, have you done, has it done that to any of you guys yet? When you're in Saturday school, you tell him some bullshit, he'll call me up at home. Hey, I got a student right here who's telling me that, uh, <laughs> that you told him that red valves were bad. I'm like, no, red valves are good. All right, we'll get to that next week. Okay, most piston engine overhauls are, are what? Um, just uh, repairs. Simple repairs. Uh, the difference is, that is, unless, unless the engine has an internal supercharger or reduction gear that is not a spur type gear. Then it is a major repair. Well, what the hell is that about? Internal supercharger, what do you suppose that is? Supercharger inside the engine. Very good. It is a, is a gear driven <laughs> supercharger that is internal to the engine. You cannot see it from the outside. So it's not a turbocharger. Uh, most of the time they are um, centrifugal type uh, superchargers. Um, or a reduction gear that is not a spur type. What's spur type? It's, it's just a simple gear arrangement. So one gear next to another. So small gear, big gear. So just remember all the ratio problems we did? Spur mm -hmm. gear. All right, so, um, so if it's not a spur gear type, that means it'd be the, and I'll show you later, the um, uh, sun and planet gear system. That type would be a major repair. So what they're saying then is that it's a major repair to disassemble, it. well, it's not a major repair to disassemble, but to put it back together, it is a major repair. So what would that mean? I mean, to, to the average mechanic. More work. It's more work. Regular mechanic, you can't do the work. Close. You're you're on the right spot. Who can do the work? The IA. <coughs> oh, mechanic can do the work. The IA has to. Fund there it. you go. The IA has to sign it off. And you, need a repair and you need a major alteration repair form. So what is it really saying? It needs another set of eyes. Mm. They're forcing you to get another set of eyes. Unless you're an IA, then you don't need another set of eyes. Um. <laughs> Which is crazy because most of the entire thing about being an IA is about paperwork. Would you still recommend an IA to get another set of eyes just to look it over? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Because what good would it do to get an IA who's never done one before? When they show up like, whoa, that is cool. I've never seen one of these before. Is that the guy you want checking it off? I mean, me, I'd rather have some guys who, you know, doesn't even have an A&P who can barely, you know, he's got his walker and goes, dude, I've overhauled 800 of these things back in the war. And I'm like, oh, man, show me, you know. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Uh, okay, so we got overhaul, we got rebuild, and we've got recondition. What does recondition mean? Not an FAA term. Does it change the purpose of it? Means whatever. You want it to mean. <laughs> I reconditioned this engine. I took some Scotch Bright and I sanded a little bit and I painted some new Lycoming gray on it. And uh, there we go. <laughs> Recondition is literally whatever. So people use that word a lot. I've seen it before. Uh, usually not on engines. <clears throat> Um, out of the cylinder line, I'm working with you guys. We, uh, we reconditioned some valves. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means whatever the hell I want to, but it means we took it over and we blasted it and we polished it and we refaced it. Did I overhaul it? Why didn't I overhaul it? Well, we should have, but <laughs> assuming we did that. 
Wasn't specifically to the FA 43 Well, it would be to the overhaul manual, but how do we test it? That was a cylinder we tested. So we never tested it. So we never tested it. We just did all this work to it. So, you know, that's a good, good, good way to put it. I always reconditioned it. I took a, I took a cylinder, disassembled, clean, inspected, blasted it, repaired it, um, and then uh, sold it. And I didn't put the valves and stuff in it, you know, like that. But it's completely, I mean, it looks brand new. Did I overhaul it? No. Because I didn't. Reassemble. I didn't test it, and I didn't reassemble it. Well, reassemble it with new valves, guides, or new valve guides, new seats. Yeah, I reconditioned it, you know. It means whatever you want to. So have fun with that. Um, <laughs> when you're looking in log books on engines, you're always going to see TT, which stands for? Total time. You have to carry the total time of the engine. So, buy an air, airplane with an engine, and I go out and I fly it for 2,000 hours, and I say, well, it's time for an overhaul. And so, um, well, every annual, you'll see the total time of the engine. I get to 2,000 hours, and I send it out, and I get it overhauled. You may or may not get that total time carried for or not. Um, total time, so manufacturer, and only the manufacturer, can grant a used engine zero total time. Uh, the engine in my airplane has like 900 hours total time. It's a factory reman. So sent back to the factory, factory remanufactured it. Notice we did not use remanufacture, we said rebuilt Overhaul recondition. So, where does this remanufacturer come in? Only, um, manufacturer. Um, only the manufacturer can use that word. I didn't write that in here, but maybe I will later. I don't know. What does it mean when an overhaul shop gives you a zero They can't. Only the manufacturer. Unless the manufacturer authorized them, if they're factory authorized, which I don't know of anybody that is. So you can go zero cents major overhaul, but otherwise the time gets carried forward. Um, so you got a thousand hours on an engine, you send it in for an overhaul, and the overhaul shop goes, oh my gosh, what the hell did you, did you do? You know, how often do you change oil? You go, change oil? You know, it's like everything in this engine's bad. We literally needed to buy you new everything. The only thing that's good on this engine is like your intake pipes and, uh, you know, I guess we can reuse the oil sump, you know, was, well, no, oil sump's cracked, I gotta get a new oil sump. So you need a new oil sump, accessory case, crank case halves, crank case, Conrad, I mean, every single part is, but you got a thousand hours on it. So they order all brand new parts, put it together. How many hours do you have on the engine? A thousand. thousand hours. But you're like, every single part on this engine is brand new. Yes, but not the data plate. Mm. You had to take the data plate off, put it on the new case. So unless they're authorized to call it zero by the manufacturer, the FA, it carries forward that time. Um, so all others, that's repair stations, unless they have FA approval to do it, and I'm not aware of anybody that does, all others carry, carry forward total time, total time after overhaul, after overhaul. So here's how I used to explain it to people who come to my shop, you know, they'd want an overhaul and they'd come look at the shop, do a tour. Mm. They'd say, well, the price of your engine is basically the same price as a factory reman. Why? And Kevin, I take my engine off, I crate it up, I ship it back to the factory. And while that one's being crated, the new one shows up on my door. So I just bolt that up on my firewall, send off the old engine. I have no downtime. Why would I not want to do a factory, factory reman when it's almost the same price as what you're doing and have downtime? I'd say, well, it's kind of like this. The engine comes in as a core, all right? You don't know what you did. It could have been a prop strike, could have been a fire, but as long as it made core quality and 
I like to tell the story about, I think I told you guys, Lycoming allows a certain amount of bend to the, the run out on the crankshaft flange. All right. But um, the service bolt used to say if it was something like 0.018 to 0.027, you could straighten it. And so I guys bring me crankshaft. I tell you that story. Guys brought me crankshaft into run out. I'm like, ah, sorry, it's way bad. Okay. Like, okay, we'll get another one. They went and they came back like an hour later. It was the same crankshaft. They just found a stump and a sledgehammer, beat it till it was like, and then like, okay, I'm like, are you gonna fly this? No, oh, we're just doing a core charge. You know, we're just doing it for a core. Put the engine together, send it back to Lycoming. Uh. Right? So, so Lycoming gets it. You know, I'm like, well, okay, here's the crankshaft pile. Hey, that meets the run out requirements for us. You know, crankcases, you know, oh, well, crankcases fine. They got all the different, you know, they recondition each one of those things. And then, you know, you, you call up and want, want a, I want the engine, and you know, all right, so we're going to need a crankshaft. We'll go to the crankshaft pile. Oh, and, you did. Right? Sorry, and so yeah. they're going to put it together, and then you get all the way done. You're like, well, what time do I assign that? Zero. I'm the manufacturer. It's zero total time. Yeah, the crankshaft's been in a crash. and so That's that's like uh, standard procedures for the manufacturer. Who guys put a fault for that? What fault? For an accident. An accident? Well, if that engine got in an accident? Yeah. Well, it's assuming that there was something wrong with it that they didn't find. But otherwise, okay, let's just say there was a, well, if there's a crack, they should have found it. It's, yeah. it's just knowing what the history of your engine is important to most people. Very important. That's, yeah, that's the and then the final sales point was you're standing right here next to me. And if anything goes wrong with your engine, you know you can put your hands around my throat and choke me to oh, death. And like, shit. sold. <laughs> so. Something to be said for not having to drive all the way back to Pennsylvania to hurt somebody. Yeah, because most people wouldn't know that that's what the manufacturer does as far as... I'm not saying that's what they, you know, I don't need to dis... To, you you know. discredit them, yeah. Yeah, I don't need to discredit them, but... Who's to say? It's a sales pitch. I do know that people do stuff like that and send things back for core. What happens after that? I don't know, you know. Maybe the manufacturer just burns them all and just say, hey, we just wanted it to get rid of it. All right, um, we have SMOH is a big, big one. I write that in my logbook every year, and that is? Since major overhaul. Time since major overhaul, as opposed to minor overhaul, which I don't know what that means. But SOH just doesn't roll off the tongue like SMOH does. All right, so my engine, is a weird one because I look in the log books and it was a 90s, I don't know, whatever. Um, I see that they bought the engine, put it in the aircraft, factory remand. Zero total time. How much since major overhaul? Zero. Zero. So it's all zero time because I got a crankshaft out of an accident probably. So, so then I'm looking and then 400 hours later it says, Aircraft engine overhaul, this date, and goes through the whole description of, of the overhaul. Um, and by the way, they disassembled, cleaned, inspected, and reassembled most of the engine. So it was overhauled the engine this date, with the exception of starter adapter, oil pump drives, um, all accessories, I mean, <laughs> this list of things they didn't do, and then said major overhaul, which... I think the FA would have a real hard, hard, hard time with, um, but I got new cylinders and everything else. And so I called the overall shop and why would you overhaul an engine at 400 hours factory remand? They said, oh, it sat for a long time, had some corrosion on the camshaft. So we just decided to do a whole overhaul at that point. But because it only had 400 hours, we didn't do any of the other stuff because it's barely broke in. I'm like, all right. So I have a engine that's got something like, I don't know, 600 hours since new and 200 hours since major overhaul. So it's kind of weird. You don't normally see those times so close like that. Uh, so that's time since major. So how long can you go um, between overhauls on an engine? As long as, as long as you want is the actual question. Well, there's a thing <laughs> called TBO, which is time between overhaul. And it is set by the manufacturer. Set by manufacturer.
Um, you'll often find it in uh, service bulletins, service bulletins, um, service instructions, uh, the M-0 manual for uh, uh, Continental. But it's actually more complicated than just saying, well, this particular engine is this many hours. Like, mine is somewhere between 14 to 1800 hours. Mm. It's like, and that depends. Because it'll say, well, if it's used for ag purposes, then it's completely different. If you fly consistently um, X number of hours every single month, then you can extend it beyond this. If you have one built between this date and this date, it's this many hours, one after this date with this spec number and this serial number, then it's going to be a little bit longer and they'll even tell you why. And so um, most of them aren't that difficult. Um, and then they all say, or 12 years, whichever comes first. Is that due to the type of flying? Like the ag stuff? Yeah, like yeah. Low level. Yeah. Into a field and then it's full power. Yeah. I think it might power. even say something about gliders or banner towing in there as well, because you're just just abusing the engine. Um, okay, so you, so the manufacturer sets these time between overhaul, also 12 years, and so you figure out your time between overhaul. Who has to comply with this? Hardly anyone. Hmm. <laughs> so. So the law is anybody like me and, and these guys with their airplanes, we're private citizens flying under Part 91. We do not have to comply with service bulletins, instructions, or letters. We do have to comply with instructions for continued airworthiness, um, but they don't actually write them in there. I want to be careful I say that because that's even argumentative. So uh, we don't have to comply with that. We can go as long as we want. It's up to us. Yeah. <laughs> operations absolutely as soon as you get into anything where you're getting paid uh, 135 your charter operations um, flight schools a lot of times depending on how it's arranged then they do have to comply with that so you hit that magic 12 12 years or those hours boom it comes apart although I'll tell you right now I don't know anybody I've never ever heard anybody go oh I'm at 11 and a half years it's time to do it they all just ignore that and look at the hours Everybody I know does that. All right. Um, so time between overhaul. So who's got to comply with that? Nobody. You're for hires, basically. Private citizens do not. So that means that we're basically doing it on condition. So for on con and and also time between overhaul. A lot of times you hope you get to that. A lot of planes don't. You know, like mine made it what 400 hours. Before I bought it, that was it. Got corrosion in it, had to come apart. No. Uh, no guarantees. But we do on condition, which means oil analysis checks, talk about that, always inspecting the screen, um, compression checks, everything else. All right, sometimes you see STOH, that is? Since top overhaul. Since top overhaul. Well, not really an official statement from any of the manufacturers. It's just a fact that cylinders take an abuse. They crack. They start leaking. So you get a leaky cylinder. Well, you can take off a cylinder and repair it. Well, what if you get a leaky cylinder and then another leaky cylinder and then that one's leaking again and those two over there got cracks in them or they're all leaking. Well. But you're thinking, wow, well, man, my oil analysis is always good. I don't have problems there. I've got, um, you know, no reason to take the bottom part. Or maybe you're, you're, um, you're only halfway to TBO. Now, like, geez, I've only got like a thousand hours on the bottom end. It just seems so strong. It's running so well. But these cylinders are just crappy. I'm not having a problem. So you take all the cylinders off, send them out, and have the cylinders overhauled, and put it back on. Well, now you got a since stop overhaul. Mm -hmm. I was talking with somebody today that was, yeah. That it's not that uncommon. Some people will actually like do this weird thing. I wouldn't recommend it, but they'll they'll do like a top overhaul, and then they'll go like another five or six years, then do a bottom overhaul, then go you know another ten years, then do a top, and then a bottom. It's, it's like they never have an overhauled engine. It's just always parts and stuff. But I wouldn't do that unless 
there was a reason one one part or the other needed it all right um so anyway so you as aircraft mechanics have to decipher all of this keep track of it and every year at annual you have to note that so when i'm doing my log entries throughout the year you know when i want to do an oil change i can just put um the date and tack time really just date uh, but every annual, you have to keep track of your, um, I like to keep track of my TBO, total time, uh, not TBO, since major overhaul, total time. Carry those forward so everybody's on the same page. So, all right, so we talked about that stuff. Let's see. Big takeaways from that. Big takeaways. Do not screw around with that overhaul word. Disassemble, clean, spec, repair is necessary. And... Yeah. Test to yeah. approved data to the law. As we like to say, it's not a problem until it's a problem. And when it's a problem, it's a big problem. Because so I like the FAA, and, but once they catch on to you kind of being a bad mechanic, then they start looking. And that's the kind of stuff where they can really nail you easy to that kind of stuff. It's like, what exactly did you do? Yeah, like they know where to look. They know where to look. Yeah. All right, let's talk about cleaning. Well, depend if you were to go work at an overhaul shop, and let's be honest, a lot of shops out there aren't overhaul shops, but they'll overhaul engines anyway, because how hard could it possibly be? The entire book is less than one inch thick. I learned how to do it in A&P school, so let's just do it here. Save the client some money. And that's all fine and well until something doesn't go well, and then, then it's fine until it's not fine. But assuming you're working at a reputable place and you're going to do an overhaul, the cleaning methods are going to vary by what they want to do. Uh, I'm sure it's going to vary a lot depending on what state you're in. In California, we're probably the most difficult state to work in. So what do we got? So we'll talk about some of the methods I had, some of the stuff you have here. Obviously we have the pressure cabinet. Is it okay if I say my shop all the time? I was so stupid doing that. I wish I could, it's still in existence, I could run you through it. You're like, oh, I get what you're saying. Um, so I had uh, my helper did all the disassembly for me. And we would get the engine in, put it on a stand, take a bunch of photos all the way around because every air engine, even though they're exactly the same, they're different. They have different places where the, um, an oil line came off of, different little brackets, different little fittings. You always want to get the fittings back on the same space. So we do that, and then I would have a Basile, is his name? Is his name, he's not dead. Uh, Basile would take apart the engine for me, and uh, we had every single engine had a cart uh, roughly about the size of this table about four stories tall four shelves and every every engine got its own cart and it was all always laid out in the exact same way like top shelf shelf number one had these parts shelf two had these parts three and four but he would take it apart put it on the shelf all uh, the cart all nasty and greasy and oily and walk it out to our pressure cabinet and pretty much everything went through the pressure cabinet just didn't matter what it boom went through and uh, got all the oil and nastiness off right away. <clears throat> um, and we used a Stoddard solvent after that. We have a safety clean here. That's the safety clean. I don't think it's spelled that way. It isn't. It's like clean with a K. K L E E N. Yeah. So. Safety clean. We have our safety clean. I don't particularly, I mean, it's fine, our, our safety clean cabinet. Um, what I don't like about it is I think it's a water base. Um, I prefer to Stoddard solvent. It might be spelled right. A Stoddard solvent, uh, which is actually a petroleum based thing. So what we could do is go right through the hot sea washer, which pressure cabinet is, of course, water base. And note, too, that you should have seen in the Lycoming Overhaul Manual where it warns you to not use water-based stuff with soaps that could cause foaming later on in the operation of the engine. So it's very, it's very critical that you use a soap that's a non-foaming soap. So it may, 
uh, hot sea mix, uh, special non-foaming soaps. It was acceptable for this. So um, let me see. So when you wash it with a stoddard solvent and not the safety clean, you're using a true petroleum base, and it tends to displace the water on the part and offer a, a level of corrosion protection. Um, so everything would then get, um, depending on what was going to happen next, a stoddard solvent wash. More often than not, it would, it would be a combination. So then we'd have uh, blast cabinets. So we have all kinds of different media. Um, there's garnet, which is uh, some sort of gem. Yeah, I guess it'd be like less than diamonds but incredibly hard. If you put a valve, well, we, we did use garnet in uh, some of our valve heads to really get them clean. But if you the garnet hit the stem, sparks would fly off the stem from the ripping off the chrome flashing. Uh, glass bead. Um, this is very harsh. This is just harsh. Since I've left the overhaul field, I can see the glass bead is now considered a no-no in on engines. They don't want you using it. Uh, we know from NDT that glass bead will peen over any cracks. So it's really bad for NDT. So bad for NDT. You won't find cracks and stuff. I will use glass bead as a last resort, especially around here. If it's well, we're either going to throw it away or glass bead it. I will glass bead it and get the rust off. Out in the field, I did work on some antique engines where you kind of got up against a wall like that. It's like, but then again, those overhaul manuals didn't say you couldn't use glass bead. So you could um, use it on some of the older, older engines. But on a modern, modern engine, I would do it. If it came down to that, it's like, well, throw it away or use glass bead. And the manual says, don't use glass bead. Guess what I'm going to do? No, I'm not going to use glass bead because it just told me not to. So to do something in direct violation of the manual to help my customer save money is only going to bite me in the butt because when the FA comes to knock in, they're not going to go, oh, no, 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 no. I told him to do it. He saved me 20 bucks on a new thing. So uh, plastic. It's actually an acrylic. I think it's like acrylic windshields. Uh, love it. Love it. This is good stuff. Even though I can I hit the pin. Love it. There we go. It is awesome stuff. It is so mild. It will rip off uh, carbon. It will strip paint. It will do all kinds of stuff. But take a piece of Sharpie and write it on a crankshaft. You're not going to take a Sharpie off. Hmm. It just takes stuff that's flaky and loose and, and knocks it off. Hmm. So it does absolutely no damage to anything. I suppose if you had some pretty thin aluminum, like 032 aluminum, and you hit it with uh, plastic. plastic at a high enough pressure, it could dent it, but I don't think it would. Um, sodium. Like baking soda. I think that's what I meant to say. Uh, I need a special booth. I need special booth. I hate it. I don't. It's very mild, extremely mild, um, and yeah, very mild. Oh yeah, because it's very. Uh, yeah. And um, nutshells. Usually walnut. Um, same as plastic. Same thing. All right, so I was thinking about the procedure that I used in my shop. So disassemble, and then we would do pressure cabinet. Um, let's see, aluminum painted parts. Got the dip, got the dip. So 
well, I, I think I've told you before, when I first started working at the shop, we had the Turco stuff, the really nasty, smelly stuff. Everything went in there because it was a decarburizing. It would actually strip carbon off of any part and you just wash it off of the hose. But that is, stuff is so nasty and so caustic. I was not sad to get rid of it. As great as it worked, I freaking hated it. But you got it on your skin, it burned um, like acid. Um, it was nasty. So we used a hot, another hot sea product that you could leave a case inside this stuff for like three days and pull it out. And sometimes it would strip off the paint, sometimes I wouldn't. So, uh, so pressure cabinet, um, that's kind of an extra step. You could skip it all together if you want a pressure cabinet. And then we do blast media. Uh, then we'd go pressure cabinet. Um, and then either, so ferrous, let's put steel, steel parts, we did the stoddard. So it came out of the pressure cabinet, then went right into the stoddard solvent, got a nice clean stoddard solvent rinse, and then just a blow dry, just, that was, that was great. It, and then the um, aluminum, aluminum parts, got um, just a water wash, just a water wash. Um, this water wash would take a long time because one of the problems we have is that with the pressure cabinet, you're using plastic pellets and stuff. Those plastic pellets find their way into places where they shouldn't be. So we'll take a break and then we'll talk about that. Break.